Right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and welcome to Thursday night's training on uh, the, tw the 20th of June, on Thursday. And tonight, we've got Sandy Ashfield talking about something that's very close to my heart. I've got the book right here, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Ah, there we go, <laughs> by Stephen <laughs> Covey. Let me tell you, um, my foundation... Um, is self-development. I've read over 300 books. But let me tell you, this book is the very first book that I read um, in the line of self-development. Uh, you know, we're talking nearly 30 years ago. And that just set the pace uh, for the rest of my life. And um, what do they say? Readers are leaders. And it's so important to read and enrich your mind. And this man, I learned so many different principles. And you've all heard of us talk here and then um, the word, the buzzword called paradigm and the word paradigm shift. This is where the concept comes from. Is Stephen Covey, which Sandy's going to talk about now. And uh, when I met Sandy just on seven months ago, um, it was the day that she was registering and signing up with LifeWave. And I don't know how we got onto the topic, but we ended up talking about self-development and you spoke about Stephen Covey. And straight away, um, that's when Sandy said she's a three principle mind fit coach. And I said to her, one day you are going to be standing on the stage talking about the seven habits. And we were just chatting about that in conversation in January. And guess what happened three weeks ago? Sandy standing on the stage talking about the seven habits. She did that three weeks ago so beautifully at our first one day convention. And Sandy did it in 10 minutes. I don't know how you crammed it in, but you did an amazing job. And um, a lot of people have been waiting for the extended version tonight where you're going to be talking about um, the seven habits. So um, I just want to say thank you, Sandy, for everything that you do uh, for this community. Uh, you, you presented on Monday night. You presented last night. You jumped in when a person wasn't able to. Thank you for always being there. And uh, thank you for being the inspiration that you are to so many people in this community. And thank you for everything that you do. So guys, get your popcorn ready. And most importantly, never mind the popcorn, get your paper, get your pen and paper out. You guys are going to take some notes tonight. We've got some really exciting um, training lined up by Sandy. So without any further ado, Sandy, over to you. Thank you so very much, Chris. I have to say what a what an incredible privilege it is for me to be part of this community and to be learning from all of you. Um, it has been an absolute joy journey for me from start to finish. And, uh, you know, I have to say that uh, having the opportunity to, to talk on the seven habits, I can only hope to do justice to the legendary late, great Dr. Stephen R. Covey, because um, his work has stood the test of time. And the same as you, Chris, um, we've had a copy of this book in our family for well over 30, 40 years. And I can tell you, it's at this um, version of it, it said over 1 million copies sold. And that's the same version that you have. And now there are over 40 million copies of this book that have been sold. So it's really exciting to see the way in which these principles have just been a, a solid foundation and a time-tested guide. Um, and really it's not a book about tips and uh, tricks on effectiveness. It is a time-tested guide on building character because character alone actually gives us the energy it gives us the know-how and the courage to pursue any opportunity that we set our sights on and also to, to prevail over any challenges that may arise because character is actually a composite of our habits. And our habits are actually nothing more than the consistent and often unconscious patterns that express our character and in turn, give rise or produce our effectiveness or our ineffectiveness. So Aristotle actually says that we are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but rather a habit. 
And it's in our habits that we have the key to self-mastery. In our habits, we hold in our hands the ability to actually become the creative force in our lives. So it really is a privilege to be talking about this amazing material this evening. And I'm going to share, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If I may, please just be with me as I bring these slides up. Um, let me know if we go, I'm just quickly going to go to full screen. Just bear with me, everyone. I'm hoping that that is coming through nice and clearly for everybody. 100%, um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so, so much. You know, the seven habits are all interrelated and interdependent and sequential because in these seven habits, we have habits one, two and three, which invite us all to work on ourselves, promoting self-mastery. And habits four, five, and six enable us to engage synergistically and effectively with other people. Habit seven is all about renewal and sustained growth in all of the dimensions of our lives, our spiritual, mental, physical, social, and even financial uh, dimensions. So habit one for me is really the most important because habit one is the habit of choice. Habit one is be proactive. Now, this the essence of this is really to act or be acted upon. If we um, if we apply proactivity, we actually take responsibility for being the creative force in our own lives and recognizing that we are able to choose our responses to any circumstances and to any opportunities that arise. So habit one really puts us into the driving seat. We are at the wheel with the, the opportunity for choice. And very often, we are spending far too much time in what we call the circle of concern. Now, the circle of concern is the red circle that we can see here. And these are all circumstances over which we have no control. So we are reactive to these circumstances. It might be politics, it might be the economy, it might be the weather, it might even be other people's opinions about us or what people think of us. We are not in control of that. So that is our circle of concern. And the habit of being proactive takes our focus away from the circle of concern and places it very clearly into what is our circle of influ influence. This small blue circle in the middle, the circle of influence is the things which we can control. And here we can apply habit one of being proactive. We are in control of our attitude, our education, the skills that we learn, our enthusiasm, our habits, and even our hobbies. And if we focus on the things that we can control, we'll actually see that our circle of influence grows. So rather than reacting and worrying about conditions that we have little control over in our circle of concern, if we focus our positive energy um, into our circle of influence, we will recognize that this actually puts us into the, the driving seat and at the wheel. If you look at these two guys um, at school, both of them failed a math test. One guy says, our teacher is no good. That's why we failed. The other guy says, damn, I better study harder. I've got no one to blame but myself. Focusing on what we can control and actually taking responsibility is the key to actually acting rather than being acted upon. Now, if habit one is be proactive, habit two is begin with the end in mind, because this is actually the habit of vision, where one, we were put into the driver's seat in habit one, but habit two actually gives us the opportunity now to figure out what our destination is going to be. What do we actually want in life? Where do we want to be? in five or 10 or 15 years time. 
And this is the, the place where we actually get to write the program for our lives and allow that plan to guide our decisions. So Dr. Covey was very, very um, uh, instrumental in teaching us about the importance of having a mission statement. And for me, a written mission statement is actually a very powerful thing for the very reason that it is written down. Now, um, at the at the recent um, our training forum, uh, I, I was talking about when I chatted to Lucinda and Chris about um, the, the importance of writing down a goal, Chris shared with me how he wanted to be the first senior presidential director in LifeWave in South Africa. And that goal was written down. Lucinda shared with me that that goal was not just written down in one place. It was written down everywhere it was on the mirror in the bathroom where you know they'll get Chris will get ready in the morning it was on the fridge if they open the door for a snack it was on the windscreen of the car if they were driving uh, somewhere that goal was written down in multiple places where it was visible all the time and so the power of actually writing down your goal and committing it to paper is is very powerful effective people actually shape their own futures through planning they decide who they want to be they decide what they want to do and they decide where they want to be and so when we have a clear destination in mind, we are exercising habit two, which is begin with the end in mind. We are writing the plan. Habit three is called put first things first. Now, habit three is actually where we know where we're going. We know what the, the end in mind is, but this is how do we get there? And we get there by putting first things first. But what are the first things? First things are the things that move us in the direction of achieving the purpose that we set out in habit two. So whatever our end in mind is, the first things are the things that are gonna move us towards that goal. So if we're driving towards that destination in habit two, Habit three is all about what we need to have and what we need to do to get there. And we need to have the ability to say no. And this is a hard one for me because we have to be able to say no to things that distract us from our ultimate destination. That's a big one. So um, is that ultimate goal our health, is it our um, uh, knowledge, is it our relationships, is it our career, what is that end goal that we have in mind, and what do we need to say no to in order to achieve it? Now, there are always going to be distractions that come up in life, and sometimes those distractions are actually emergencies, and we call those things urgencies. They are urgent, and they take our attention immediately and sometimes consume us, but they take our attention away from what is important. Um, important things are the things which actually align with our highest values and our priorities. But the urgent things are not aligned with those things often. It might be a burst geezer that requires immediate attention. It's urgent, but it's not important in terms of moving us towards our highest um, goals. So Stephen Covey actually gives us a wonderful matrix, which um, I find extremely helpful because it graphs the two elements of importance and urgency. So you can see at the top of this graph, we have um, four quadrants here, number one, two, three, and four. And urgent and not urgent are graphed along the top and important and not important are graphed down the one side. So you can see that um, activities that fall into quadrant one are both urgent and important. The burst geezer that happens 
is something that we have to drop what we're doing right now, get a plumber in and, and get it sorted out. But um, what's important is that if we are continuously spending time attending to demanding unexpected emergencies, we are never getting to focus on the important things, which are not urgent, but they are important in moving us towards our end goal. So we're really needing to shift out of quadrants one, three, and four, and into quadrant two, which is the not urgent, but important activities. You'll see that quadrant three are things that are urgent, but not important. These are things like interruptions, other people's emergency, telephone calls coming in when we're busy. Um, and quadrant four are the, um, the entertainment aspects of our lives. Things like just, you know, watching Netflix or, or doing things that are really just for leisure. They are not urgent and they're not important, but they do take up a lot of our time. So one of the things that has really helped me with staying in quadrant two, which is the important activities that contribute towards our mission, our values and our high priority goals is to use a, um, an hourglass timer. Now, an hourglass timer, I find quite powerful because when I flip that timer and I put it on my desk, I know that I have got one hour while the sand runs through that hourglass where I am not going to permit any distractions. I'm not going to take any telephone calls. I'm not going to do anything during that hour except for focus on my most important quadrant to activities. Because you see, um, the way that I spend my time has got to be aligned with what's deeply important to me. Because otherwise, the normal day-to-day -day trivialities will come in and eat up that time. This is what traditional scheduling normally looks like, is that everything comes in and fills our week from Monday to Sunday. And it can be quadrant one emergencies, it can be quadrant three interruptions, it can be quadrant four um, leisure time, watching something nice on Netflix. And what happens is that our quadrant two important goals and priorities don't find time in that schedule during the week to actually become uh, a priority. We cannot put them in, um, uh, in because the time is already used up. It's used up by the other things. But if we look at effective scheduling and we take those quadrant two activities and we turn over the hourglass and we say, I am not available for the next hour because I'm focusing on my most important things that I need to do first. Then those quadrant two activities get scheduled in first and everything else has to fit around that. So, so often, particularly in LifeWave and to chatting to people about the business opportunity, I often hear people saying, I'd love to do that, but I'm just so busy. I wish I had more time, but I just don't. I'm so busy. But very often, people are busy with the things that are not moving them any closer to their highest um, goals and uh, and um, and values and missions. So George actually on our triple three group some time ago posted a a copy of a book called Eat That Frog, and there's a lot of value in that little book which talks about doing the hardest things first. Starting off in the morning and eating your frog is almost like doing what is the most challenging, difficult, and most important tasks first. And getting that out of the way is just eat that frog. Um, Onyx Cole in her video also shared with us that um, she makes three phone calls a day. Uncompromisingly, she makes three phone calls a day, but she does that consistently. And that that was her modus operandi to, to moving so quickly to senior presidential director. And very often, you know, one can get to the end of the day and you haven't had a chance to make one phone call, let alone making your 
three phone calls. But if that is your first and most important priority and you schedule it in like these quadrant two activities, then nothing else can actually come in and shake that. So I'm very grateful to, to Dr. Covey for this matrix. And if we look now at the first three habits, we've talked about habit one, which is be proactive. That means that we are in the driving seat. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. Where do we want to go? Where is this journey taking us to? And habit three, put first things first, is how are we going to get there? What are we going to need to say no to? Which roads are we going to have to avoid diverting along in order to stay focused on this outcome? And you'll see that these three habits, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first, are all about self-mastery. These three habits move us effectively from a place of dependence to a place of independence. So um, remember that our habits are simply patterns of behavior patterns of behavior that can be learned and they can be unlearned. So through our self-awareness, we can actually understand the impact of um, our actions on ourselves and on others. And so let's look at what we call the maturity continuum. And if you look at the bottom of the maturity continuum, we start at a place of dependence. When we come into this world, we are completely dependent on our parents to, to take care of us and to keep us safe. But as we move through this maturity continuum, we have to get right these private victories at the bottom of this, um, of this continuum, starting with be proactive. That is all about um, becoming the programmer of our lives, writing the program for our lives. The second habit, begin with the end in mind, is about writing, writing that program down and deciding where we want to be, what we want to be, and how we want to be. And number three, the habit three, putting first things first, is how we actually run that program and what we say no to to get there. And those three habits are called our private victories because they are all about personal mastery self-mastery and they move us from <clears throat> dependence through to independence and you'll see that the next three habits take care of our public victories now our public victories are those victories that we have with others and we can only begin really to become effective in those relationships with others when we have self-mastery and when we've really bedded down habits one, two, and three as private victories. So the first of the public victories is habit four, which is think win-win. Now, think win-win is a habit all about mutual respect with others. Um, this is about having a frame of mind and a frame of heart that constantly seeks out mutual benefit with others and in all human interaction because agreements are actually mutually beneficial and satisfying and they have integrity and maturity and an abundance mentality at heart. So approaching interactions with an abundance mentality, seeking mutual benefit gives us the opportunity to engage with others in a mindset that there is plenty for all. Um, a wonderful example of of win-win for me within LifeWave is also that um, you know I've been afforded the opportunity to to do presentations here in Bryanston from time to time, and I am so privileged to have the opportunity to present at the beautiful um, Jan's home in Bryanston. And Jan and I are actually on two completely different legs in LifeWave. We don't share a, a common leg within the LifeWave family, but Jan hosts the presentation so beautifully at her home. She does a beautiful tea. She handles all of the, um, the RSVPs. She gets to invite um, uh, 
everyone who she would like to invite. And I get to come do the presentations, not have to worry about any of that and invite um, guests to come along. And it's a wonderful win-win that's mutually beneficial. And we both have an abundance mindset about what we're able to both bring, even though we're kind of on opposite on opposite um, uh, uh, ends of the spectrum as far as the our, our life wave downline goes. We don't share a downline, but we are so um, excited about the opportunity to be able to share hosting um, the, the Bryanston presentations. So thinking win-win really allows us to express ourselves with um, courage and also consideration for the ideas, the feelings, and the outcomes of others that are that are required. So thinking win-win is um, is so important in engaging with others. Habit five is seek first to understand and then to be understood. Now this is all about empathic listening because you can see here we have a father and son and they're having a discussion on the left of the slide. And then this dad goes to his friend and he says, I just cannot understand my son sometimes. He won't listen to me. And his friend says, you can't understand your son because he won't listen to you. I thought that to understand someone, you have to listen to them. Now, I find this so interesting because Habit five is the habit of understanding. But how often do we, even within LifeWave, we, we can sit down with, um, with somebody so excited about what this technology can do for them and so excited to tell them about which patches we think would be um, a, a good protocol for them to follow. But we often jump into that before we have even begun to listen to what it is that they have to say. And I find sometimes it's so powerful to actually just listen very, very carefully and allow trust to be built so that you can actually repeat back to the person who you're listening to exactly what it is that you've heard from them. And that actually changes very often your response to them. Uh, Stephen Covey actually talks about an interaction that he had where he climbed onto a bus and on the bus there were three children actually behaving very badly. One of them was very angry, the other one was crying loudly, the other one was sulking in the corner and the dad who was with them on the bus seemed to just be not caring at all. He wasn't doing anything about trying to control his children's behavior. So Stephen Covey went across to him and he actually said, you know, would you mind getting your children under control because they are disturbing everybody else on the bus? And um, the dad looked at him and he said, I'm so sorry. Their mom has just passed away and I don't know what to do. And in that moment, Stephen Covey says that he actually understood. He understood the situation completely differently to how it had looked to him when he got onto the bus in the first time, in the in the first instance. And uh, he was then able to change his response from a place of compassion and empathy rather than from a place of irritation. And so in seeking first to understand, we can actually change our engagement with others um, and listen with that intent to, to understand. And then, yes, it does take courage for us to clearly and accurately express our point of view when we are wanting to contribute to that conversation and to be understood. But the trust is then already established. So empathic listening is actually understanding the other person's frame of reference before we express our point of view. Now, habit six is the habit of synergy. Synergy is really a celebration and um, uh, just an absolute joy in valuing the differences that we all have in relationships. It's actually the habit of creative cooperation between people. Two people working 
cooperatively and interdependently, not independently, interdependently, have got the potential to multiply exponentially the results of each of them working separately. And LifeWave as a model could not be more um, of a synergistic model than anything I've ever experienced. Here we are sharing resources. We are coming together as a collective from all around the world, different cultures, different countries, different um, different experiences, and we're able to create the most incredible synergy through our shared resources and our shared information. So in the word synergy, you'll notice that urge, E-R-G, the word urge is actually an erg is one unit of energy. And synergy is actually the releasing of the full energy in any relationship. So it's accommodating other people's viewpoints, other people's opinions, and other people's perspectives, giving rise to creative cooperation amongst everyone. And so habits four, five, and six are the public victories. These are the victories where we are able to engage with others effectively. When we move from dependence through habits one, two, and three to independence, those are our private victories. And they are the victories at the bottom over here. Let me just show you dependence at the bottom, moving through habits one, two, and three to independence are our private victories. Those are the victories that we have with ourselves. And as we move from independence to interdependence with others, those are where we have our public victories and we exercise habits four, which is think win-win, habit five, seek first to understand, and habit six, which is synergize. So when we think win-win, this is all about mutual benefit. There's got to be something in it for both of us. Otherwise, it's not going to energize both of us, right? What would be a win-win for you? And sometimes we just have to split that cupcake straight down the middle. And we have a rule in our house is that one person gets to cut the cupcake. The other person gets to choose which half they would like to have. <laughs> so that makes it perfectly fair. Then it's a win-win solution. Habit five is empathic communication. And we get this right through first seeking to understand the other person's point of view and then to be understood. And habit six, which is synergize, is creative cooperation with everybody, knowing that we all are bringing and contributing something of value to the end goal. Now we have a look when we've completed the, the, the public victories and we've moved from independence through to interdependence, we have a look at habit seven. Now, habit seven is all about the, um, the habit of renewal. It's called sharpen the saw. Now, this guy says, hey, why don't you sharpen that thing? It's going to take you six hours to cut this tree down at this rate. And the other guy says, I don't have time to sharpen the saw. I've got to cut this tree down. Now, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but this has happened to me. I've been so busy driving and needing to get to places that I've actually forgotten to fill up on petrol. And it only happens when you're at that absolute deadline and you need to get somewhere in five minutes and the car runs out of petrol. You need to pull over to the side and it stops you in your tracks because that is not taking time to actually sharpen the saw. Making sure that you are doing what needs to be done to make what you do sustainable. So a blunt saw simply cannot chop wood. And if we're too busy driving to fill up on petrol, we're going to have to come to a stop. So it's very important that in order to grow, in order to change, in order to improve, we balance that by sharpening all the dimensions of our skills. And we have to engage in continuous improvement and radical self-care 
to ensure that what we do is actually sustainable. So um, I'm going to link this habit, habit seven, right back to quadrant two. You remember the four quadrants where we've got quadrant one full of urgent and important things and quadrant two that are not urgent, but they are important. So that's like putting the petrol in the tank before it becomes urgent. Once we've run out of petrol, we're in quadrant one. Then it's urgent and it's important because we aren't going anywhere unless there's some petrol in the tank. So quadrant two is where we actually sharpen the saw. That is our self-care quadrant. That's where we practice radical self-care to ensure the sustainability of what we do. So preserving, improving, and continuously nurturing ourselves, regularly and consistently working on all of the important dimensions, physical, social, spiritual, mental, and financial, to ensure that we are, are taking care of all of those priorities. And on this slide, I'd actually like to just share a little story with you. And I'm sure that all of you have heard the story, Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg. Now, this is the story of a poor farmer who finds a glittering golden egg in the nest of his goose. And he's suspicious about the golden egg, but he takes the egg home and he tries to break it open and he finds to his amazement that that egg is made of pure gold and every morning he goes and he has a look in the nest of the goose and he finds another solid gold egg and he continues every morning to go and collect this golden egg that his goose has laid and eventually he amasses a great deal of wealth but eventually he grows greedy and impatient and he slaughters the goose because he wants all the eggs at once only to find that there's nothing now, the, the moral of the story really is that um, production, which is those golden eggs or the desired results, need to be balanced with production capability, which is the goose. And without the goose, there are no golden eggs. So P versus PC balance is all about our production capability. And we actually are the goose that lays the golden eggs in our lives. And we often push production, which is the golden eggs, at the expense of what makes us capable to produce, which is actually the goose. So destroying our capability of getting results actually destroys our sustainability. Um, what is so interesting is that very often, People are, are driving themselves to such an extent that they're neglecting their health. They're neglecting their well-being. Stress levels are through the roof. They're not taking care of their diet, not finding time for exercise, not saving that little bit of money every month. But, you know, everything is just an all or nothing approach. And so ensuring the sustainability of everything starts with taking care of the goose and that's habit seven where it's sharpen the saw and sharpen the saw in every respect your finances your health and well-being um you're taking time out for your family ensuring that um uh, that there is time prioritized for your most important outcomes um so if we have a look back at our model Habit seven actually circles all of the other habits because habits one, two, and three, which move us from dependence through to independence are our private victories that we have with ourselves, our personal successes. And habits four, five, and six move us from independence to interdependence with others. Now, habit seven ensures the sustainability of all of those things, both in the private um, or, or uh, self-related victories, as well as the public um, victories, which are our relationships with others. 
So using the seven habits, we're actually able to create a pathway to get us to the, the goals and outcomes that we set for ourselves in a step-by-step -step way. And um, it's actually about creating that plan for our lives um, and living that plan every day, using our timer to protect our time and to decide what is going to fill it, not waiting to see what's going to emerge during the day, thinking about what the end in mind is and then putting first things first in order to enable us to get there. Um, thinking abundance with other people who we are engaging with and understanding first through empathic listening then harnessing the diversity within the relationships that we have and constant renewal. So I'm just going to put up what the seven habits are for everyone to be able to see, because in the beginning, we spoke about the importance of character and that character is actually a composite of our habits. And Aristotle says that we are what we repeatedly do. So I have to say that LifeWay actually presents us with the most incredible opportunity to practice these seven habits on a daily basis as valuable tools to help us to build a successful LifeWay business and to find fulfillment in both the private and the public victories on a daily basis. Because remember that you are the goose. You are the goose that lays the golden eggs. And um, in the words of Barbara Banks, now Barbara is the wife of Sid Banks, the Scottish mystic and uh, the uh, just renowned Three Principles founder, Sidney Banks. And um, it is just so interesting that Barbara says, you can have anything you want in life. You just have to really want it. Now, I found that so profound because if you really want anything, it's 100% possible. You just need to be putting the steps in place to achieve it and to say no to what doesn't align with it. And if you don't really want it, it's, it's very possible that it's not going to come your way. If you really, really want it, you can put your daily habits in place to make it possible for yourself. So um, this was just a, a very brief overview of the seven habits of highly effective people. And if you haven't read it, I would really encourage you to read this very, very powerful book by Dr. Stephen Covey. Keep it in your library because it is a time-tested guide step-by-step -step guide to really building the character that can change your life. And um, I must say, I was quite surprised recently where uh, in the back of a little book, I had actually written out my goals and aspirations for my life. And in tidying up that particular bookshelf, my, my husband presented me with that piece of writing. And he said, just have a read of that. And it's interesting because over 30 years ago, I had actually written down that I would love to be involved in a business one day that's able to help people to live their best life with optimal health, vitality, and well-being. And um, it's so interesting because I never knew what that vehicle was going to be. And I've been in the skincare industry for over 24 years. I've been privileged enough to, um, to, to own over three sorbet stores, employing a staff of over 90 beautiful women. And it's been the most incredible joy journey for me being part of, um, of that industry. But um, this, when I was approached recently to, to sell my stores, 
I didn't know what lay ahead, but I was um, I was definitely open to a time of change. And so um, I didn't know what lay ahead. And um, it was quite funny the other day, profound even, when I was parked at, um, at Jan's house and Chris came to me and he said, Sandy, did you know that your number plate number is 39? And I looked at him. And he looked at me and I thought, really? I had got my new car in January and the number plate was 39. And Chris said, that's no accident. And it's so interesting because, you know, when we write down our, our mission and we write down what it is that we want to achieve in our lives, um, it's amazing how being intentional about things is able to, um, is able to, uh, affect the trajectory of our lives in in a powerful way so I feel extremely privileged to be on this journey I feel extremely privileged to be learning from the most amazing people within the LifeWave family and also those who I'm engaging with as I'm sharing the technology with them whether they choose to join LifeWave or not it's an in enormous privilege to have the opportunity to engage with people um, on, on such a personal level. So I really hope that tonight has been helpful for you. It's been such a, a lovely privilege to, to uh, share the wisdom from Dr. Stephen Covey in this amazing book. And thank you very, very much, Chris, for the privilege of, um, of that opportunity. I hope that it's been helpful for everyone. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. That was off the charts. Thank you, Sandy. That was absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, I just had to write there. How's that for synchronicity? I mean, the number plate with 39 <laughs> on it. I mean, the I same month you got the car that you joined LifeWave. <laughs> Absolutely. I had got the card just before the 15th of January. I didn't even give the number plate a second thought, but it actually has an X in it and it's got 39 as the number and that is it. So um, it's it's just been uh, fascinating and I always refer to LifeWave as my joy journey. So my vehicle has a, has a 39 on it. <laughs> thank oh, you it's so much. amazing. Oh, thank, thank you, Sandy. You, thank you, thank and you. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this training, and I hope that it was was valuable. So, thank you so so much. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Bye, everyone.